Every semester when I ask students what they know about uh, John F. Kennedy, um, what usually comes up are things that he was the first Irish Catholic president um, in American history, that he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he died in office, uh, very similar to Abraham Lincoln. Um, they might even tell you about some of the dirtier side of Jack Kennedy. Um, the idea that uh, he, he, he was a guy that uh, loved the ladies, and the ladies loved him right back, if you will. Um, but just about everybody uh, that, 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 I've, uh, that I've taught uh, would be able to finish the sentence uh, that goes something like, ask not what your country can do for you, but we're able to finish that sentence, right? Well, those are the things that you tend to remember about Jack Kennedy. First of all, JFK, John F. Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, they're all the same guy. I prefer using the name Jack Kennedy. But anyway, um, people remember him talking about, you know, this very inspirational uh, vision for America. Uh, they remember Camelot, which at the time was uh, a Broadway musical that was really, really doing well. And a lot of people saw a lot of similarities between Jack Kennedy and, and King Arthur's Camelot. And the name kind of stuck. Um, what you don't tend to remember so much is Jack Kennedy, the Cold Warrior. You don't really remember that inaugural address where he issues a stern warning to the Soviet Union, basically drawing a hard line in the sand and daring them to cross it. Okay. Now, the simple fact of the matter is, Jack Kennedy very much is, even if you could ignore some of the things that he accomplished as president, he, he really is a significant president. I guess for no other reason than he's the first president to be born in the 20th century uh, to, to ultimately become president. Okay. Um, so when he says that this is a torch that's being passed to a new generation of Americans, he really was being serious that there's a new generation of Americans that are assuming leadership roles in American politics. And aside from all of that, the nation really is ripe for change when it comes to leadership. The 1950s, especially the late 1950s, were not exactly a... Um, uh, an easy time. I mean, you got the depths of the Cold War, and the Soviet Union has the bomb, and people are building bomb shelters, and you've got the civil rights movement that's, you know, you know organizing in the streets, and the, uh, the opposition is raging this fight with them. So the bottom line is, we really need an effective leader, and I think we got one at a really important juncture in American, uh, American history. Now, you can't understand the Kennedy presidency if you don't understand this process known as the new politics. A little bit of background on Kennedy before we go any further. Kennedy was a child of privilege. Um, he was born into a very wealthy family. Uh, Joe Kennedy was a shrewd businessman and uh, he sent uh, his kids to uh, private prep school, later on sent them to Harvard University. And so Kennedy wanted for nothing. Okay. Um, he was a war hero. He had served in World War II. Uh, he served with distinction in an incident that became known as PT-109, where he was awarded all kinds of uh, uh, honors in the aftermath of the war for saving the lives of his crew. Uh, Japanese had torpedoed a boat in the Pacific Ocean. He was responsible for saving the lives of a lot of his crew members. But in any case, after the war, Kennedy launches a political career, and he starts out in the House of Representatives. And in 1958, he, uh, he, he successfully runs for uh, a seat in the Senate. He's a senator from Massachusetts. And to be quite honest with you, there was nothing remarkable on his record. There was nothing that he did, uh, uh, like, for example, um, you know, Teddy Kennedy, uh, in our much more modern times, really was the health care guy. When you thought of health care in the Senate, you typically thought of Teddy, Teddy Kennedy. Anyway. In 1960, Jack Kennedy declared his uh, candidacy for the presidency on the Democratic ticket. Now, the opposition was very quick to point out that this guy did not have any kind of real experience, that that was the big thing that he lacked was actual experience. And he, in 1960, that is, he was running against a guy that oozed political experience. Richard Nixon, you know, was a congressman with 
all kinds of experience. He had sat on numerous really important um, um, uh, congressional committees, so he had lots of experience in Congress, and what was more is for the last eight years he had served as Dwight Eisenhower's uh, vice president, so it wasn't just experience that he had, he had an incumbency on his side. Eisenhower was a relatively uh, popular president, right? So anyway, um, the one thing that Jack Kennedy had going for him, I guess one of maybe two big deals that he had going for him, was the fact that he was very good looking, right? Um, he was good looking and he understood that this new invention known as the television really had a power that could make or break politicians. This is the essence of the new politics. Really, you're talking about um, TV. 1960 was the first time in American history that we televised a presidential debate between the Democrat and the Republican. Knowing how important of a force TV was, Jack Kennedy brought in makeup artists and uh, famous hairstylists that made him glow under the lights. He looked like a million bucks. Richard Nixon was far less photogenic, and uh, he was just one of those guys that had to like shave three times a day, uh, and if that wasn't bad enough, he sweated profusely, so after the camera got done showing you, you know, glowing Jack Kennedy, it panned over to Richard Nixon, who looked like death warmed over. Everybody that tuned in to the debates that night on the TV thought that Jack Kennedy won. I mean, after all, he's prettiest, right? Uh, but on the flip side of the coin, everybody that listened to the debates on the radio said that Richard Nixon won. So you can see how powerful of a force that TV would become and still is in American political life in the United States. Now, I don't have time to get into the, the finer details of the 1960 uh, presidential campaign. Let me just tell you that Jack Kennedy pulls out a victory, but it's a very narrow victory. It's one of the closest races in American history. Now, when you win a very close race like that, you tend not to govern with a lot of authority. You, you tend to be kind of, you know, passive when it comes to forcing the issue with things. Kennedy is trying not to isolate people that voted for him in 1960 that might not be so inclined to vote for him in 1964 because of whatever policy that you're talking about. And if you hear me correctly, I'm largely talking about civil rights. Kennedy didn't think that he was going to be the civil rights president, at least not initially anyway. Um, as far as he was concerned, he had been elected because people needed a, an effective leader to help them through the Cold War. And that was really his preeminent concern, taking the oath of office in 1961. Now, in 1959, Fidel Castro has come to power in Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of Florida, uh, America's shores. And this is problematic for a number of different reasons. Number one, it's communism that's in our backyard. And number two, Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union, has issued a warning that any invasion of the island nation of Cuba would be perceived as an act of aggression on the Soviet Union itself. In other words, if you invade Cuba, we're starting with World War III. So it ain't as simple as just simply, you know, sending in the Marines, right? In any case, the plan that ultimately is hatched to deal with Castro is referred to as the Bay of Pigs invasion. The idea is we're going to take these Cuban fighters from the outgoing uh, exiled regime, the Batista regime, we're going to take them, we're going to train them outside of Cuba, and then we're going to transport them back and make it look like what's basically happening is a Cuban civil war. And if our guys win, in other words, the, Bast the Batista supporters win and they defeat Castro, then you know, what are we supposed to do about this? This isn't our business, right? Well, moving people around the Caribbean Sea is one thing, but if you really want an amphibious aquatic invasion to be effective, you better be prepared to support it with air power. And that's where Kennedy really drew the line. He was not willing to go ahead and uh, call in airstrikes, which proved to be a fatal mistake, as Castro's regime not only uh, survived and repelled the invasion, but it was horribly, horribly embarrassing for the Kennedy administration, considering we got caught their hand in the cookie jar. Right? What we were trying to do is play regime maker in the Caribbean, 
And in the process, uh, we kind of got found out uh, for having these very selfish motives. And it was something that was very embarrassing to the Kennedy administration. And later he owned up to it. But uh, this is not exactly the way that you want to hit the ground running. Right? Now, on the opposite side of the world, Jack Kennedy's got a lot more success with what's happening in Germany. Now keep in mind, after World War II, Germany was divided and uh, the eastern chunk of it was pretty much occupied by the Soviet Union, which had installed a communist regime in what comes to be known as East Germany. Now in West Germany, what you've got is not only democracy, but you've also got a rebuilt economy. Uh, you've got roads and hospitals and streets and schools and jobs and food and all kinds of great things. Um, even on its best day, the Soviet Union couldn't even dream of rebuilding Europe the way that the Americans had uh, rebuilt their sphere of influence in, in, in Europe. And so ultimately, what Germany, what Eastern Germany anyway, what it was was smoldering rubble. Now think about this. You don't have to be a political scientist to understand this. Um, if you live in East Germany and you're seeing all these new and cool things going on in Western Germany, you might be inclined to go over there and move to Western Germany. Well, to stop the outflow of Eastern Germans into the West, uh, the Soviet Union built a wall that comes to be known as the Berlin Wall. Um, they put armed guards along the Berlin Wall and they policed it very heavily. And Jack Kennedy's administration had a field day with this. He said, look what an effective form of government uh, communism really is. In order to keep people from running away from it, all they needed to do was build a wall. Right? So, I mean, this is a really, really important symbol, not only of the Cold War and also Soviet repression within that Cold War, but it's an excellent tool in fighting the Cold War from the perspective of the Kennedy administration. The problem is, on the eastern side of that wall, there's actual human suffering, okay? There's people that don't have enough food, they don't have medical supplies, they don't have the things that are going to get you through in your day-to-day -day existence. So you can't really invade. Um, that's, that very well may cause World War III. Um, but you can do the next best thing, and which is exactly what we do through something called the Berlin Airlift. Right? Those planes that had, maybe not those planes, but planes that had bombed Germany back to the Stone Age uh, a few years earlier are now being used to drop food, medical supplies, water, other necessities that are, are really helping the Eastern Germans. Um, so from the perspective of the rest of the world, we look like superheroes. Here we are providing this huge helping hand to a country that we really don't have any vested interest in. Um, and the Soviet Union looks like the evil empire. They look like these persecutors that won't allow people to go reconnect with family or just go to a place where they can make a better life for themselves. So this is a really effective tool in, in fighting the Cold War. But let's be honest. I mean, all the marbles are over there in Cuba. I mean, Castro is going to be a thorn in our side for the rest of the 20th century. Now, in 1963, uh, American military officials noted a really disturbing pattern in that it wasn't just Soviet troops that were being moved into Cuba. It was also nuclear weapons, uh, complete with missiles that are being moved in as well. Keep in mind, this is the post-Sputnik era, and the Soviet Union had long-range uh, missiles that are now 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And so this is a terribly, terribly concerning development for the American people, especially the Kennedy administration. Now, before we go any further, you really have to ask yourself, why is Nikita Khrushchev, why is the Soviet Union doing this? Well, if you remember me talking about the American effort under Harry Truman to rebuild Turkey, this might make a lot of sense. Once we rebuilt the Turkish economy, Turkish society, we were allowed to build some Air Force bases. And if you're looking at a map, um, Turkey is a hop, skip, and a jump away from the Soviet Union. Well, in the late 40s and the early 1950s, uh, the way that you delivered a nuclear bomb was the way that we had done so in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. It was by plane. And so as far as Nikita Khrushchev was concerned, those Air Force bases in Turkey was a dagger to his throat. He had to neutralize it in some way. And this method of putting nuclear missiles in Cuba was, was his way of neutralizing the threat of the United States and Turkey. Now, if you're Jack Kennedy, you've got a decision to make. Um, the decision is really, really difficult because you can do nothing. 
and basically uh, be, at, be at the behest of the Soviet Union for your survival for the foreseeable future. Or you can demand that they pull out and risk, um, uh, risk nuclear war. Ultimately, what Jack Kennedy did was blockaded Cuba. No more Soviet ships got in, which was a very risky move if you think about it because, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't speak fluent Russian. And the only thing that was standing in between the human race and nuclear annihilation for approximately three days was the goodwill of American and Soviet sea captains. Okay? Now, ultimately, cooler heads prevail, and we kind of strike out a deal. The United States agrees to take down those um, Air Force bases in Turkey. And the Soviet Union agrees that uh, it will take out those nuclear missiles from Cuba. Now, essentially, we both capitulated, but from the perspective of public relations, we won. Here's why. The Air Force bases in Turkey were equivalent to a VCR. Um, if you've never heard of a VCR before, it means that you're much younger than I am. Uh, but it's a dead technology. Putting in a video cassette tape to this VCR machine, nobody does that anymore. We, we use Blu-ray players, or maybe if you're behind the times a little bit, you use a DVD player. Uh, you watch it on your computer on these snazzy little discs, or you download it digitally, right? So it's dead technology. And by 1963, the Air Force bases in Turkey, they were also dead technology because the way that you deliver a nuclear weapon is by missile. It's no longer by the Enola Gay, right, by plane. So anyway, we got something that we wanted. We really didn't have to give up anything that we were already in the process of taking down anyway. But when the Soviet Union pulled out, they did so with the entire world watching. More importantly, what would come to be known as the Cuban Missile Crisis is really going to have a profound impact on American policymakers uh, that would later go on to really important positions of leadership. I'm talking about the Vice President, Lyndon Johnson. I'm talking about uh, Bobby Kennedy, who was at the time the Secretary of State. He'll later on become a really important senator. I'm especially talking about the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who would serve under both uh, JFK and Lyndon Johnson uh, in what would be the Vietnam uh, conflict. Okay. So anyway, their idea here is when you have a communist foe, what you do is you don't bend, you don't blink. You draw a hard line in the sand and you force the issue with them. I mean, maybe you communicate, but you certainly don't give in to their demands. That'll make a lot more sense when we get, once we get to Vietnam and sort of the ideological straitjacket that we put ourselves in when we fight that war. Okay? But for the time being, understand that this threat of nuclear war certainly had a profound impact on the Kennedy administration. Um, one of the things that comes out of the missile crisis is the idea of the Peace Corps. Now, what the Peace Corps is, is a collection of young, industrious, uh, college-age students that go into developing world countries and help them stabilize their societies. Um, you know, when we did this, when we established the Peace Corps, it was another effective tool in the fight against communism, because here we are helping these countries establish governments and whatnot, and we're not asking for anything in return other than friendship. That's really all we're asking. So we look like the good guys. The Agency for International Development, uh, what would later become known as AID. Um, in the early 1960s, farmers produced so much food that we couldn't consume all of it, so what the government did was it sent it to countries that were having a hard time feeding their uh, uh, impoverished populations. The Alliance for Progress pumped $20 billion into the world economy to combat global poverty. Now don't get me wrong, we're not investing in the world economy, we're simply putting that money out there to help people with really no strings attached. But what we're doing in the process when we clean up the world economies, we're making the appeal of radicalism, in particular communism, making that far less uh, resilient, far less um, um, appealing. Okay. Keep in mind, it's Kennedy that really takes this space race to the next level, committing America to not only uh, landing a man on the moon before uh, the Soviet Union, but doing so before the end of the decade of the 1960s, which actually happened in 1969, uh, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. Now, in terms of domestic agendas, um, Kennedy inherits this urban crisis that we were talking about uh, last time. Um, to that end, he's got this situation where poor people are trapped, not only in the cities, but they're trapped by a changing economy in which they're really not qualified to compete in. 
One of the things that the administration does is sponsored a law called the Area Redevelopment Act of 1961. And what this does is it gives businesses all kinds of incentives, tax incentives and otherwise, to relocate in economically depressed areas. We're talking about you know, Oakland, California, Detroit, Michigan, uh, Newark, New Jersey, places where once upon a time they had been really important manufacturing centers, but they had largely fallen on harder times by the late 1950s. In order to educate this uh, collection of workers uh, that would now have access to some of these, uh, these industrial jobs, uh, the Kennedy administration supported the Manpower Development and Training Act, or just Manpower Act of 1962. And this pumped uh, a lot of taxpayer money into federal programs that were designed to educate uh, inner city people, uh, helping them to become skilled tradesmen so that they would be better able to compete in the 20th century economy. In short, what Kennedy did domestically is expanded the security blanket that was social security. He promised to raise the minimum wage and in, in a lot of ways he promised to expand the concepts of the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt. I hope you notice that I did not say civil rights. The early days of his presidency, Kennedy didn't want to touch the civil rights movement with a 10-foot pole and I'll tell you why a little bit later. One of the groups that was really important in getting Kennedy elected in the first place is a group of young people that had become really, really dissatisfied with politics and the American context. Um, we call this group of people the New Left. Now, the reason that they were called the New Left was because in a lot of instances, they were the children of those social and political activists of the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the old left, the socialists, the communists, uh, the people that made up the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, um, people like Woody Guthrie, if you will, uh, that went to fight fascism abroad, uh, people that wanted to fight fascism at home. Well, if you've been following along with this, you know that uh, the Red Scare, uh, McCarthyism, anti-communism had really driven these people underground. So the old, old left was gone, and out of its ashes grew the new left which was a very youthful, it was very young, it was very militant, it was very adamant in what it wanted, and um, energetic social movement that wanted America to get back to doing the right thing in the world once again. Um, the people that liberated concentration camps and handed the Philippines back to Filipinos, we, that's what we wanted to get back to doing. The number one group affiliated with what can loosely be called the New Left would be Students for a Democratic Society which consisted of college students all across the country, but predominantly from Midwestern and West Coast universities, uh, institutions like the University of California at Berkeley. Um, they come together in Port Huron, Michigan, right across the border from Canada, to sign what would become known as the Port Huron Statement. And in short order, what the Port Huron Statement says is, we've got this great country, it's got all these great democratic principles, the problem is we're not living up to those democratic principles. And so what SDS and the New Left, generally, generally speaking, what it wants America to do is end these archaic discriminatory practices like segregation, move away from that. It also wants an end to these rigid Cold War policies that are not only really ugly, you know, us deposing populist leaders in places like Iran and replacing them with these brutal dictators simply because we want cheap oil. Um, we want to move away from that and get back to doing the right thing again in the world. And most importantly, SDS wants the government to be really, really proactive in producing both of these initiatives. Okay? So it wants the government to bear more responsibility in this process. Now with respect to civil rights organizing, there is an influx of activity and enthusiasm, especially in the early 1960s. Um, Ella Baker was an African-American activist that had helped to found what comes to be known as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Um, this was a very youthful civil rights organization, but what I want you to understand is it's an interracial organization. Of course, there were African-American activists, but there were also a lot of white activists that believed deeply in their cause as well. A leading official in SNCC was our good friend Diane Nash, uh, the lady that had really coordinated uh, the sit-downs, not the sit-downs, but the sit-ins, rather, in uh, Nashville uh, in 1960. 
And so one of the things that SNCC is really responsible for sponsoring is the sit-in movement that's really expanding across the country and it's also expanding beyond simply the lunch counters. And so as you might imagine, just like in the case of Memphis or maybe even Greensboro, it provokes violence. The, the, the racist establishment reacts very violently and because we now have the technology that is television, what it does is it beams these violent images back into people's living rooms when they're having dinner or uh, coffee in the, in, the, in the evening. Okay. More importantly, what it does is it forces Jack Kennedy to at least pay lip service to the idea that this shouldn't happen. It's forcing him to become more active in civil rights circles, and that's important. The other civil rights organization that I'd like you to be mindful of would be the Congress on Racial Equality, or CORE. The CORE traced its roots back to 1942 when an African-American activist by the name of James Farmer uh, started it more or less as an organization that welcomed anybody that was interested in racial equality, white, black, brown, or green, right? The problem was not only had CORE more or less been replaced by SNCC in terms of importance, um, it really didn't have a campaign, it didn't have an issue or an initiative that it really needed to focus on at the time. And so in 1961, what the Congress on Racial Equality developed was what we call the Freedom Rise. And the idea was pretty simple here. Even as late as 1961, interstate travel was highly segregated. Um, the way that this country moved across the country at that point was by bus. You, you didn't hop on a plane to go from Detroit to Chicago. You took the Greyhound bus. But if you were black, you couldn't even so much as order a cup of coffee at the bus station. And I'm sure you can imagine some of the various other uh, wrinkles within this racist system. And so the idea that the Freedom Riders had was, uh, we're going to ride Greyhound buses across the American South, and we're going to start out in Washington, D.C. I've provided you a map if you want to follow along with me in uh, the PowerPoint presentation. But uh, uh, from Washington, D.C., and weeks later, we're going to end up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, when they rode across the Upper South, um, things weren't exactly smooth, but they really hit trouble once they got to the Deep South, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, okay? Um... When they hit Alabama, the Klan knew that they were coming, and in a lot of instances, they were able to organize these rallies that would essentially surround the bus. Uh, they would break out windows, and they would toss in explosives, including Molotov cocktails, and when everybody ran out outside the bus to escape the, the flames, uh, the Klan would beat them within an inch of their life. Well, again, you've got this being televised and sent back into people's living rooms. And once again, this is really going to put Kennedy on the, uh, the Kennedy on the defensive when it comes to civil rights. I mean, he, after all, is the executive in chief, um, and it's his job to enforce the laws. And here we have Greyhound buses that are being bombed on, on U.S. interstate highways. This, this couldn't be much more black and white, no pun intended, when it comes to enforcing the law. Martin Luther King also steps up his efforts with civil rights organizing in 1963, and in particular, he takes aim at Birmingham. And the reason being is King described Birmingham as the most segregated city in America. And so what he ultimately wanted to see happen was a massive uh, boycott, really, of Birmingham stores and other institutions that profited from black money but refused to hire black workers or even allow black patrons to use the bathroom. The chief of police in Birmingham was a man by the name of Bull Connor, who, it must be said, was a racist and felt that it was his job specifically to maintain the racist social order. And so when King showed up and began picketing downtown Memphis, Bull Connor had him arrested for picketing without a permit. The other thing that Bull Connor decides to do is to turn police dogs loose on these demonstrators. Uh, he turns on fire hoses, which lift people up and slam them against uh, brick buildings. And again, all of this is being captured on American television, and it's really putting the Kennedy in an administration in a position that it can no longer just sit back and watch this happen. It's going to have to do something, okay? Before we get to that, though, I want to talk to you about Martin Luther King 
and his letter from the Birmingham jail. Now King was arrested and from the jail cell in Birmingham he penned one of the more famous uh, documents in American history, uh, his letter from the Birmingham jail. Up until that point, King had been taking a lot of criticism from the white churches who said, look, Rome wasn't built in a day and you need to be patient. And more or less what the letter from the Birmingham uh, jail says is, uh, you'll find it difficult to be patient if everywhere you go you're constantly reminded that you're a second or even third class citizen. When you're constantly reminded that you're not good enough and you can't participate in even the, the, the most basic levels of American life, you'll see how and why it's difficult for us to wait. In other words, we can't wait anymore. This is the reason why we're protesting. I mean, Bull Connor, that's the most vivid reason why we're protesting here. Okay. Now, Birmingham makes the Kennedy administration choose sides, and ultimately it chooses the side of the movement. In June 1963, Kennedy went on national television where he outlined his um, vision for civil rights reform. Now, this is significant for a number of different reasons, but on the most basic of levels, it's been approximately 100 years since the federal government has provided any kind of legislation when it comes to civil rights. It was the aftermath of the Civil War. That's a long, long time, right? And so this speech that he delivers on TV goes on to become known as the Second Emancipation Proclamation the idea that the federal government would begin to take the lead when it comes to enforcing and pressing the issue of civil rights really was a huge development in American history and, and that's part of the reason why that it's called the Second Emancipation Proclamation. At the same time there were racists that insisted that they would defend the Jim Crow social order to the very end and one of those individuals was a Democrat from Alabama by the name of George Wallace. George Wallace uh, was determined to keep the Alabama university system um, um, exclusively white. It was a segregated system and he said, I don't care what the federal government says, I'm not going to see integration, not as my time or not on my time as, uh, as governor of the state. And so when Kennedy told him that he was going to have to get serious about this, he vowed to stand into the doorway and not allow four African-American students from integrating the uh, uh, and enrolling in the, in the University of Alabama. Now, um, you can see that if you're following along with me, that national politics and civil rights slide, that's, that's George Wallace, the guy in the suit, and the guy across from him, the bald gentleman, uh, is, is a federal agent that's pretty much telling him you're going to have to step aside otherwise we're going to have to use the powers that is the federal government to force this issue upon you. And that's in the end what ended up happening and that's how the University of Alabama was um, um, ultimately integrated. Okay, But what I want you to understand before I go any further, this is not Kennedy just doing the right thing. This is not some liberal politician that found it in his heart necessary to do this. Kennedy was forced to do this. I mean, time after time after time, there were opportunities for him to do this. He didn't do this primarily because the South was such an important block in Congress. And furthermore, it was so important to the Democratic coalition of voters. And the idea here is if you really force the issue with the South, then you very well could be jeopardizing the Democratic Party's dominance in American politics, right? So it's these protesters in Birmingham, it's these protesters elsewhere that keep the heat on the Kennedy administration that ultimately force the issue and, um, and, 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 and force them to take up the cause of civil rights. Now, um, we've focused a lot on Martin Luther King, and that's important for a number of different reasons, but it's not the only vision of civil rights activism. Um, as we found out from Chicago 1919, Detroit in 1943, there's racism in the North, uh, race riots in the North. Um, Malcolm Little was a man born in Omaha, Nebraska, um, and his father was a Baptist minister uh, in the 1920s who was a big follower of um, Marcus Garvey, uh, the leading spokesman for black separation, uh, his Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, and he also didn't exactly shuffle, he didn't roll over when it came to the racist establishment. 
And the Black Legion, the outgrowth of the KKK being what it was, they decided that they would just simply deal with the Littles by burning down their house. So they burnt down um, the Little household. And they were forced to flee, and they ultimately took up a, a residence in Lansing, Michigan. Now in Lansing, Michigan, which had a storied history of both the Klan and the Black Legion as well, um, what you had was the assassination of Malcolm Little's father. Um, Malcolm, his father, officially, as far as the Lansing Police Department was concerned, uh, had a misfortunate, uh, unfortunate accident on uh, some train tracks. Uh, more likely what happened was that the Klan tied him to the railroad and a train rolled over the top of him. So my point is that Malcolm Little's early childhood was drenched in racial violence. That was the only thing that he really knew when it comes to race relations in the United States. In his late teens and early 20s, Malcolm Little was a pimp, he was a drug dealer, he was a hustler, he was a gangster in a lot of ways. And um, it's not until he goes to jail that he really begins to transition in terms of the purpose and meaning of his life. He converts to Islam in prison, and in the process he drops the last name Little, claiming that it was his slave name. It was the name that was given to his ancestors by their slave captors, and he really wants a Muslim name. The problem is his leader, the leader of the Nation of Islam, uh, the leading spokesgroup for black separation in America, which had by that time replaced Marcus Garvey, um, wouldn't give him a Muslim name. Um, that being the case, he just adopted the last name X and became Malcolm X. Okay. Now, Malcolm X began to establish these mosques uh, throughout the Northeast and to some extent the Midwest too, but in places like Boston, places like um, Philadelphia, and especially Mosque Number 7, which is located in, in Harlem, New York. And in these mosques, he preached a very apocalyptic brand of Islam, but it also had unmistakable messages that involved civil rights and civil rights activism. Okay. Malcolm X continuously preached that his followers should be peaceful, but peaceful to the people that were peaceful with them. In other words, if there's somebody that puts their hands on you, then you make sure that you don't let them put their hands on anybody else. Um, X was frequent in his use of by any means necessary, implement civil rights by any means necessary. I mean, the establishment, the racist establishment, that is, is not above the use of violence, so why should we be above the use of violence with the establishment? As you might imagine, this is a very different vision of African-American protest, African-American dissent. It's very different than the kind of activism, you know, sponsored by Martin Luther King in places like Birmingham, the weapon of love and turning the other cheek. Um, ultimately, though, uh, Malcolm X is going to come under some criticism for being a person that's pretty good at talking a good game, but not so good at walking the walk. All of that would change um, with the Johnson-Hinton incident, okay? Johnson-Hinton uh, and a friend of his, both of whom were members of the Nation of Islam, they were walking home one night in Harlem when they saw uh, NYPD officers uh, beating up to African-American um, men. And when Hinton screamed at the cops saying, hey, this isn't Alabama, this is New York, um, the cops turned their attention to him. They, they beat the daylights out of this guy, uh, arrested everybody, took him to the station, and word got back to Malcolm X that this had happened, uh, that, that he had essentially been uh, arrested, and we should really look and see, check in on him, make sure that he's okay. So Malcolm X, um, leads a group down to the station where they demand to see uh, Johnson Hinton. And as you might imagine, uh, the commanding officer says, this is none of your business, this is official police business, and you need to go home, you need to leave immediately. It's at that point that Malcolm X instructs the police officers to look out their window, and what they see is that the Nation of Islam, or at least uh, his followers in that particular occasion, had completely surrounded uh, the station. And he didn't necessarily say, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen, but he pretty much allowed them to let their imagination do their work. So in any case, 
the commanding officer allows Malcolm X to go back and see Hinton, at which point X kind of gives the all clear wave and everybody goes back home. But it's discovered that Johnson Hinton was in very critical condition. He had, his brain was essentially bleeding. Now, had Malcolm X not insisted on seeing him, he never would have been able to have him rush to a hospital where doctors later saved his life. And so this incident, the Hinton incident, really kind of made Malcolm X, really put him on the map when it comes to that militant brand of activism, um, that radical brand of activism that really had not been seen in, in, in protest circles in African-American America or otherwise. And so Malcolm X is going to become a really vivid um, alternative in, in more than one way to the activism of Martin Luther King. But before I let you go on, oh, I don't want you to assume that what I'm saying is that Malcolm X was somehow more radical, somehow more militant than Mal Martin Luther King. In a lot of ways, Martin Luther King was far more radical in the sense that his activism was far more proactive and it was far more hands-on than, 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 than Malcolm X. Um, in any case, what I need you to understand here are really two things. One, Malcolm X is really beginning to develop quite the following in these urban ghettos in places like Chicago, Detroit, uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, Oakland, California, those places. The other thing is, he's really forcing the establishment to choose what type of civil rights activist they want to deal with. You can deal with Malcolm X, and that might be disadvantageous for a number of different reasons, or you can deal with this other guy who's saying, look, all I want is integration. I'm willing to use the power of love to get that. But ultimately, the establishment warms up to Martin Luther King, and, you know, just like the IWW, just like the Communist Party in the earlier part of the 20th century, this particular brand of radicalism is successful in the sense that it's no longer giving politicians, mainstream leaders, a choice. You must take up the issue that is civil rights activism. In the summer of 1963, Martin Luther King um, is assisted by an SCLC uh, official by the name of Bayard Rustin in what would come to be known as the March on Washington. Um, Rustin, in a lot of ways, uh, was the inspiration to Martin Luther King. Certainly, he had schooled Martin Luther King, and Rustin, uh, an African American homosexual, would later become very active and important to the LGBT community uh, later on in the 20th century. But for the time being, that March on Washington, where you had a quarter million people that descended on the National Mall, um, to hear King give this speech where he said that his dream was that one day his children would be judged on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. We see that as the high point of civil rights in the United States, the civil rights movement. I don't necessarily mean that you're not going to see actual progressive and in, in, in positive, that's what I mean, manner legislation coming out of the federal government. What I'm really saying is that this is that, that things are going to assume a darker character in the post-1963 way. I mean, in a lot of ways, you're going to be seeing the unraveling of the civil rights movement. Um, we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about why that happens a little bit later. But for the time being, I want to talk to you about um, 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 what's next for the Kennedy administration. The bottom line is we don't know what Kennedy's civil rights platform would have looked like considering he never got to deliver it. Um, he was assassinated in Dallas before that was able to happen. So civil rights is ultimately going to be an initiative that's taken up not by Jack Kennedy, but rather his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, which is going to be the topic of conversation in our next uh, lecture.